because I looked at, at skin and I looked at skin care and I said, you know, I've, I've done so much work on wound healing mm-hmm. and especially with chronic wounds. And we know with chronic wounds, there were so many challenges because basically through time, a whole lot of waste products had accumulated that stopped any sort of uh, progress in terms of treatment of these chronic wounds. And we learned from that that you had to prepare a chronic wound. You had to do a wound bed preparation, get rid of the inflammation, keep it down, keep it moist, do all this sort of thing before you apply your, your procedure. And that's when the globe went off for me. And I said, this is my aha moment, because what happens with skin? This is a chronic wound. We're exposed to sun every day of our lives almost, in, right. especially in a region like California. And then secondly, with the wear and tear and aging, we've got a situation going on which is just like a chronic wound. And I thought, you know, nobody sort of approached this like, what happens with skin? Like a chronic wound accumulates all these waste products. What happens with skin? Do we accumulate these as well? Mm -hmm. And that became my, my sort of passage of thinking. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Technology of Beauty where I have the opportunity to interview the movers and shakers of the beauty business. And today is no exception. Today, I have the opportunity to interview for the second time, Dr. Alan Widrow, who comes up from Orange County here to beautiful Manhattan Beach, home of the Technology Beauty Studios. Thank you, Alan, for coming up to share your time with us. And Thank being on you the for program. having me, Grant. Always such a pleasure to be with you, my friend. Same, yeah. absolutely. And I know we have some new information to share. Indeed. And uh, we'll get to that. But first, uh, how have you been? (laughs) You know, it's been a busy year, I must say. I think I was here a year ago and we're talking about plans and what was going to happen. And, you know, I'll elaborate on that a little later. But uh, I'm good. It's been a busy year. It's been a challenging year, but an exciting year. So that's great. Great. So let's go through a little bit of your past. If the viewers want to watch your first episode that was like you mentioned about a year ago but let's start with this i know you're not from the united states you have a beautiful accent and you're from south africa indeed and did you grow up in south africa i did i did so i spent most of my informative young years in in south africa in fact my professional years as well and Uh as you know i'm a plastic surgeon by trade and i practiced there for 20 plus years And when I made the decision to move over here, it was really one that uh, I needed to rewire, not retire. Let's get into something completely different. One of my passions there, although I I loved plastic surgery, let's not get this wrong, the the profession is beautiful. It opens up uh, oneself to creativity and science and this incorporation of things. It allows us a lot of lateral thinking. So uh, when I left uh, and decided to leave the profession, I needed to go into something that I had equal passion about, and that was really research. Right. Is how could I create a, a hybrid of, of groundbreaking research, but also get into the entrepreneurial um, startup sort of zone. Now, I didn't plan that right in the beginning. I'm talking now like this was you know, a, made, a, a plan. <laughs> Those sort of things only happen when you're on the ground and you can take advantage of things that are happening immediately. Mm-hmm. So when I came to the States, to be absolutely honest, the first two years I had no idea what I was gonna do. But I did go to UCI, University of California, Irvine, uh, the faculty there, and I started lecturing there and you know, got myself known there, worked with the residents, because that's always stuff that I, that I love doing. Also kept on nagging them, saying, guys, I want to use your lab. I want to get in there and, you know, get dirty with some, really get into some some, some good research. And it took a couple of, uh, a, a while for them to get to know me and to, to, to know what I was all about. And then I had the invitation. The guy said to me, look, one better. I know you want to use the lab. Why don't you come over and take over the lab? And that happened in 2012. And the uh, we started, I started a whole new sort of process there called the Center for Tissue Engineering. Mm-hmm. And to this day, that, that, that has kept going. It's working really successfully now. And from that, I get to keep my ear on the ground of, of what's the latest, what's happening. Because we work with rather big projects, uh, adipose-derived stem cells, stem cells that come from fatty tissue. Uh, we're working on fibrosis, we work on cartilage regeneration. So all these kind of things that are um, very sort of um, longer term projects, challenging but exciting. And then at the same time in, in, in 2015, I was introduced 
by the founder of Elastin to the peptides they were going to use. And the guys asked me, well, could I design a sort of, could I do a white paper for them on what the potential is for these uh, peptides? And at the time, I remember saying to, uh, to, to, to Glenn then, um, I'll do this, but, you know, I don't want to just write a white paper. It doesn't mean anything to me. Let me see what the potential is, you know, to go with this. And when I looked at the peptides, I decided using my wound healing background, there was a definite different narrative we could use for this. Because I looked at, at skin and I looked at skin care and I said, you know, I've, I've done so much work on wound healing. Mm-hmm. And especially with chronic wounds. And we know with chronic wounds, there were so many challenges because basically through time, a whole lot of waste products had accumulated that stopped any sort of uh, progress in terms of treatment of these chronic wounds. And we learned from that that you had to prepare a chronic wound. You had to do a wound bed preparation, get rid of the inflammation, keep it down, keep it moist, do all this sort of thing before you apply your, your procedure. And that's when the globe went off for me. And I said, this is my aha moment, because what happens with skin? This is a chronic wound. We're exposed to sun every day of our lives almost, in, right. especially in a region like California. And then secondly, with the wear and tear and aging, we've got a situation going on which is just like a chronic wound. And I thought, you know, nobody sort of approached this like, what happens with skin? Like a chronic wound accumulates all these waste products. What happens with skin? Do we accumulate these as well? Mm-hmm. And that became my, my sort of passage of thinking. We need a precondition before we do any procedure. And we know there's so many uh, different procedures being done in terms of laser resurfacing, all sorts of things. Well, what happens if we actually start off by preconditioning before we do that procedure? And that became our mantra. Let's get into the procedure space. Let's move forward. And from there, it's just, you know, mushroomed, as you know. But that was generally the thinking. So I went from plastic surgery using my wound healing background. And I often get this question because I talk so much to, to, to my dermatology colleagues. And I, mm-hmm. before I start, I say to them, I know the elephant in the room is what's a plastic surgeon doing telling us about skin care. And I say, I'm not talking to you about skin care. I'm talking to you about wound healing and taking that approach. Grant has changed the entire way that I approach all of this with skincare. And it's been very successful for us. So, you know, that's been great. So the original uh, emphasis of your lab and also of Elastin was preparatory uh, moves for the for the procedure and then post-procedure? Yes, yeah, certainly. When, when, I, when you say my lab, at UCI, I do completely separate things and I deliberately do that. I don't want a conflict of interest okay. with what I do with Elastin. So there I'm doing a whole of whole lot of regenerative stem cell antifibrosis work with the last and this is the sort of wound healing approach that I took preconditioning being really important and we've gone deep into preconditioning I may have in fact mentioned on the last one really about the surgery product because which you know very well Mm -hmm. is we took it you know we started off with 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 much more superficial facial uh, resurfacing chemical peels things like that can you precondition for that yes we showed the outcomes were improved and the patient experience, especially, you know, with the exudate and the burning and the stinging, all of that seemed to control really nicely. Uh, and, but then we said, okay, what about, and we got a little bit of a hint with the, uh, with the cryolipolysis, cool sculpting at the time. Now it's developed into a whole lot of different uh, RF and different ways. But when they were doing non-surgical fat breakdown, we realized that the lipid droplets, again, were the waste products. These were being released all over the place. Uh-huh. And lipid droplets, we discovered, were very pro-inflammatory. There was a lot of induration because it took a lot of time. These lipid droplets are really big. To absorb them takes a lot of time. So we realized that if we could get this done faster and quicker, that would actually improve the outcomes and, and improve the, uh, the patient experience. And we were able to do that with non-surgical topically. Then I dipped the toe into invasive. Okay, if this works here, body contouring surgery, you know, with liposuction, we know with abdominoplasties, that we're working in the fatty space. Surely we're releasing lipid droplets there. And we found, yes, we were. So we did a whole lot of studies related to those lipid droplets and toll receptors and interleukins and cytokines that are released and found there was a good tie-up 
in the induration that we're seeing and the fibrous banding that we're seeing afterwards. So we did a whole lot of studies in invasive surgery, really looking at our product reform and repair and showing how we could decrease the fibrous banding, the discomfort involved in some of the induration and bruising there as well. So it evolved the whole way from preconditioning right up to invasive surgery, which is terrific. And that's really where we started in our wheelhouse or our playhouse is really looking at peri-procedure spaces. And as you know, everybody was scared to get into that area because you're gonna put active products onto when we're doing resurfacing or chemical peeling, you've got raw, vulnerable skin. Uh, are you gonna get adverse events? And we showed that we could do it with our beautiful formulations, non-aqueous, we could do it without the burning, without the problems, preventing infections, and the patient experience became that much better. So that became our area of expertise, and then we moved into maintenance. And in the maintenance, it's been just as exciting, and we'll, you know, we can talk about that as well. So you started on face, yeah, and you just now mentioned uh, Transform and R&R. Right. Um, those are body products, correct? correct? <laughs> Could you take us through which one came first and why? And, and, now, and you moved off of the face and onto the body for body contouring and, uh, from, uh, and accelerating the resolution of the swelling and the fat and the inflammation. Is that correct? Absolutely. So take and us through that a little bit. I think that's the un, uh, not many people know about that. Yeah. So, so the narrative here is a common one, and that's let's get involved with the procedures. And let's see what's commonly done. We started with face, resurfacing. Okay, a huge amount of, of facial work is, was being done and is being done. Mm -hmm. So we, we developed that. But at the same time, we realized that non-surgical fat reduction was also a huge area that devices were being used very commonly. First started with the cryo, the freezing, then went on to RF with the heat. Both of them affect the fat cells in different ways, but both of them break down the fat cells. So we said, every place that we worked on, we said, what's the problem here? and can we introduce something new that will solve that problem? Okay. And we looked at the non-surgical and we said, okay, there are a couple of problems, but the main thing is this lipid droplet. How do we get there and break this down earlier, get rid of it earlier, and get the macrophages, which are the cells, they're the vacuum cleaners of the body, to actually absorb this more efficiently? And we broke that whole barrier. So that was very disruptive in terms of things. The first challenge was, okay, can we actually affect those macrophages to get them to gobble up those lipid droplets a lot more efficiently? Mm -hmm. We did that. So once we did that, how do we actually get this down into the fatty layer? Because that was my question. It, correct. That's my question. How do you get it transdermal? Exactly. How do you get it through the skin and into the sub-Q? Right. I, I, I'd like to know how, we yep. do, how yep. you do that. So that was the second disruption. So what we did was, look, our, our peptides are really a small molecular weight. So they're sort of 800 Daltons round about there. If you look at a growth factor, something like that. 15,000 to 150,000. So those are elephants on the surface, whereas we can get through but we realize that the way to get through really quickly, because we want to get through when you're using that device, and the way to get through really quickly is down the hair follicle. So we designed a liposome, and John Garuda, who's a superb uh, formulator, and you know John mm -hmm. well, sure. you know, we work together, and we designed this liposome, which gets down, it's 150 nanometers, and, and, and round of anything less than 350, you can get down the hair follicle. 150 nanometers, we can get straight down into the base of the hair follicle. Just under the hair follicle, not many people know, and, and certainly many of our colleagues don't know this, but there's a white, uh, there's a, a fatty tissue around the, embracing the bottom of the hair follicle, which is called the dermal white adipose tissue. Unique little area, so interesting, because what it does is it produces antibiotics, they're called antimicrobial peptides that go up the hair follicle, so it actually looks after the skin in terms of the microbiome. It's one of the early areas with photo damage when sun comes in and damages. The first area damages is this little white pocket, this white fatty pocket under the hair follicle. And you get photo damage there that fibrosis and that causes some of the atrophy that we see in the skin and the aging that we see in the skin. So this is a really interesting area. And in humans, as opposed to mice and rats who have a muscular layer, there's a direct communication between that little fatty layer and the subcutaneous tissue. So if we can get it down the hair follicle, into the base of the hair follicle, into that little dermal white adipose tissue, we can get it into the subcutaneous tissue. And that's exactly what we proved we did. So by getting it through there, it became a shortcut. We could get a hair follicle, dermal white adipose tissue, subcutaneous tissue, action. And does place. it get to the subcutaneous tissue through diffusion or is there an active transport process? So it's a 
pure process of size diffusion um, related to that. So it really works beautifully from that from that perspective. You can get it in there. And then, of course, there's a whole lot of messaging that's taking place, but getting it in the right position is really so important first. Interesting. Okay, so now it's in the adipose right. area. And how does it uh, accelerate the uh, resolution of the fat droplets? Right. So really important here is we, we used a whole new science related to this as well. There's a process called autophagy without getting into a huge amount of detail. You know this, but uh, for your audiences, without getting into too technical detail. In fact, the Nobel Prize for, for, for physiology, I think it was in 2017, was won by the person that discovered autophagy. And in very simple terms, autophagy is the body's capacity to repackage something that is enormous. And like I've been talking about with the lipid droplets, that is enormous. The macrophages can't actually cope with it. So it takes part of the cell membrane and surrounds this big thing and it pushes out enzymes that break this down until you get to a much smaller area or size where the macrophages can cope. And that's what autophagy does. It does two things. When the cell, when you've got these big things like mitochondria and organelles that can't be absorbed, it breaks it down into smaller areas. But when you get fat cells or other cells that are, are sort of damaged, but not badly damaged enough that they're going to die, and you want them to survive, autophagy will help to give nutrients as well. So it's almost like the body's coping mechanism. Uh-huh. It says, how far down the line are you? And we've got expressions for for that, which I'm not going to use here. But, you know, if you are way down and you can't do anything about it, okay, we're going to help you to get absorbed and get out of here. Okay. If you're not and you're not badly damaged, we're going to help you to survive. And it's a beautiful mechanism. So we looked at that whole mechanism and said, you know, we need some peptides that can help us to actually take the big lipid droplet and break that down. And we found one, which is a hexapeptide 11, not the trihex hexapeptide 12, but a different hexapeptide, which actually we showed stimulates autophagy and breakdown. And we showed in the lab, and we've got some beautiful pictures of showing when you actually add the hexapeptide 11, the macrophages come in, you get breakdown of fat, they can cope with it, and we can get rid of those, those lipid droplets much faster. And is that the transform? That's the transform. So that became a story now with Transform and said, okay, this is working you know, beautifully in that situation. Let's do a study with liposuction. And we did a split uh, study where we did one side, we used the, the, the Transform and the other side, we used a bland moisturizer. And we showed the difference with gene expression. We actually showed it week by week what happened. And at two weeks, basically, we showed we could start the inflammation, but we could stop it really efficiently on the one side, the transform. On the other side, it just kept doing. The inflammation kept going, and then it petered out. But at four weeks, we showed the whole remodeling process taking place. And that's when, okay, we've got the fats, uh, the, the lipid droplets are under control now, and now you get the extracellular matrix remodeling. So, in fact, what we're talking about is speeding up this whole process of regeneration, and that makes it so exciting. Okay. And where does R&R come in? So, R&R became the natural progression, and that's why I said, you know, let's look at liposuction. We've now looked at non-surgical. Let's look at surgical and see, because we're creating a whole lot of disruption to the fat there as well. What happens if we do this for lipo? And then what happens if we do it with abdominoplasties? What happens when you do it with breast reduction? So we did all of those and we did multi-center trials, as you know, you were Mm -hmm. part of that, really showing what is the advantage of using this? So you said you're breaking down the lipid droplets. Okay, great. But what do you see in the patient? What does the patient feel? And the biggest thing that we, so we, we improved bruising, we improved swelling, we improved induration, but the biggest thing is this fibrous banding, the internal scarring, because when you don't, when you, got a whole, when you have a whole lot of inflammation taking place on the inside, it converts into fibrous tissue, and then it resolves slowly over time. That fibrous tissue restricts your movement to tell the patient, okay, about 46 weeks, you've had a breast reduction, how does it feel when you move your arm? Oh, it's a little tight, you know, it feels a bit tight. What about your tummy tuck when you do that? Oh, it's, you know, it's a little painful underneath there. That's where we showed with the split body that there was so much improvement at that 46 weeks and right up to uh, 12 weeks, 24 weeks that we could show this improvement. Patients were moving faster, that, that fibrous banding was avoided to a large extent by getting rid of those lipid droplets. So, that's so if you were going to do a tummy tuck today yeah. or a liposuction or yeah. a breast reduction, would you pre-treat your yes. patient? And then how long would you keep them on 
the R and R or transform. Let's say the R and R. Right, and you know I've skipped out a whole lot of sort of stories because the first one that we used was was the nectar that we used for uh, uh, for facial, but we also the nectar was the one we used for preconditioning. Right. We then developed a product called Enhance that was for bruising. That 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 was great. We had the transform that you talk about, and then. When I looked at that, I said, this is too complicated to go into <laughs> surgery. We've got to take all the good things from those and put it into one. Okay. So that we've got one product for surgery. That's R&R, reform and repair. And then I added an element for scar control as well. I said, okay, what do we need here that will actually help us? We'll precondition with us. We'll use it immediately afterwards. We'll use it for the scar. So you've got one product that you can use right through. Start two weeks before, and you can carry on for four to six weeks afterwards. Then if you want to carry on with that, you're also going to get skin tightening because we've got a skin tightening sort of element to it, the same as Transform, or you convert to the Transform body product if it's body contouring surgery that we're talking about. Okay. So your advice to all of us plastic surgeons, when we do body contouring, <clears throat> dominoplasty, liposuction, breast reduction, and so forth, that we should start our patients on this and keep them on it for... I heard 24 weeks, I heard four to six weeks. Yeah, yeah. so as you know with scar control, nothing less than three months is adequate in terms of that. So sure. it's anywhere between three and six months. If that scar, if there's no fibrous banding and that scar has now gone from a red to a white, it means it's mature, that's great, mm -hmm. you can stop the whole story. That's okay. usually somewhere between three and six months. Okay. The other area is the skin tightening, and that's why I'm saying maybe you want to maintain this or go on to transform, but you're going to do, you're still going to have the uh, the benefit of skin tightening as well. For the surgery, yes, three to six months somewhere on there. Okay, so <clears throat> you've gone from the face, yeah, and procedure driven, and then we went to body, yeah, um, both pre procedure, post procedure, and now recently you've also gone into a whole nother area exactly. again on the face would you share with us the new products and how you got to that point each and every one of them yeah you know and, I, and i'm so excited about this because these are really our, our specialty serum products and with each one of them and as you know i've talked to you about this many times grant my philosophy here is i stopped plastic surgery which which was huge fun and enjoyed it and loved it as you do mm -hmm. uh, and i moved on to an area that has to be fun for me and has to be uh, fun for everybody around me. We've got to create new science and new areas and new stuff that is exciting for all of us. Uh, I don't want me to. So I don't want to redo this and redo that. I want to sort of delve into and everything that I've described to you up to this uh, point is all new science. And I took the same sort of attitude here. So we've got, you know, sort of three areas. If we start with the, uh, with the area of pigmentation, that was always a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at that, I said, you know, everybody's focused around one cell and one story, and that's the melanocyte, the cell that produces melanin. Okay, that, that's, that's reasonable. And tyrosinase is the enzyme that's involved in actually breaking down melanin. So 99% of products are tyrosinase involved and around the uh, melanocyte. And I said, you know, the story's not like that. Because when we get photo damage and when we get sun striking our skin, what's the first cell that's involved? It's the keratinocyte. That's the guy that is signaling to the melanocyte that something's going on. And it's also the guy that when we're doing surgery or, or any procedure, this post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, the pigmentation is that's associated with the inflammation of surgery, is something we're all very conscious of. Mm -hmm. And that's also related to the keratinocyte, the first cell there. So can we work out what the signaling mechanism is firstly in the keratinocyte and then from the keratinocyte to the melanocyte? Then there's another area, which is melasma. And melasma, we know in pregnancy, hormone-related, that basically you get this sort of um, uh, pigmentation that is uniform and it's bilateral, and it's a different mechanism. The mechanism there that we've discovered is that there's a vascular mechanism behind the, um, behind the pigmentation. So what's going on? Well, if it's vascular, there's another cell involved. That's the endothelial cell. Mm -hmm. So I decided, you know, we've got a party going on here, and we're actually only looking at one guest instead mm -hmm. of looking at the whole, okay. the whole story. So I took the keratinocyte, and I took the melanocyte, and I took the endothelial cell, and I worked on all the pathways involved in how are they interacting. And we came up with what we call a path three technology. It's really related to the gene expression work that we did that said, 
with melanogenesis in the keratinocytes, this is what happens. In the melanocytes, that's what happens. In the endothelial cells, this is what happens. Can we, in each one of those, find an ingredient that is going to decrease the melanogenesis related to that cell type rather than just focusing on, on tyrosinase? And that's what we did and went through an extensive library and bulk sequencing of, of gene expression and all sorts of things and discovered four new components that have never been used in, pig, in pigmentation. And the amazing thing is one of them was hexapeptide 12, trihex technology. The hexapeptide 12 is an elastin You just stumbled protein. into that? We stumbled into it completely because it's a little bit like a fishing exercise. You take a whole lot of things and you say, okay, let's see which one's going to be. Uh, because there's nothing about pigmentation and hexapeptide 12. And we found, wow, this guy was working great on the melanocyte. We across the board there. Then we found something else, lactoferrin, plasmin inhibitor. We know tranexamic acid is a plasmin inhibitor. Okay, this one's working really efficiently in the melanocyte, same kind of story. So to cut a long story short there, we discovered a whole lot of new components there. We added to some recognized components, and then we went on to a whole melanocytic model, and we put them all together in a formulation and said, okay, let's see how it's working, and it worked beautifully. And we launched it, we, did the, we first did clinical studies that showed wonderful efficacy. We compared it to hydroquinone 4%, which is gold standard, but causes so much, you know, you can't use that long term. It causes so many adverse events. Mm -hmm. We showed that not only we're as good, but in many areas a lot better than the hydroquinone. And then for long term, we want slow management, long term efficient management where the pigmentation just continues to improve with outside effects and you can continue with it. That's where this came in and worked beautifully for that side. And will this help help with melasma and the mask of pregnancy or birth control pills? Yeah. It yeah. will. Yeah, it will. It will. Interesting. Because the endothelial cells, and I, I've talked to you about phosphatidyl serine before. Yes. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's a favorite of mine. But, <laughs> but that's the guy that came in with endothelin 1, which is the huge sort of messenger story for the endothelial cell. And that goes to the melanocyte and starts melanogenesis. And I think that's a lot to do with melasma. Phosphatidyl serine is really great on that. So that Along those lines, there. can pregnant women use this product? Yes. 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 Okay. There's no... Shouldn't be any problem. With and the can lactating women have. use this product? They should be able to as well. There's, okay. Yeah. Well, tell us about some other new products. Okay. So, 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 so that guy's out the way. Then we went on and we said, you know, again, with wound healing, what it, you know, one of the things that I, I knew about in wound healing but hadn't seemed to be transferred to, to skin care was that when we were dealing with wound healing, we knew that low molecular weight hyaluronic acid was pro-inflammatory that when we use dressings to heal chronic wounds, and chronic wounds have got a very inflammatory milieu, the atmosphere is very pro-inflammatory, you wanna try and put out the fire of inflammation. And so we never used low molecular weight. Everything we used was high molecular weight. I get into the whole skincare business and I see that everybody that has a hyaluronic acid, most of the companies that have them, are touting a mix of low molecular weight and high molecular weight. And they say, well, the low is gonna be absorbed, so it's great, and the high will sit on the surface of the skin, so we're working in both areas, that's terrific. And I'm thinking, you actually don't want the low. You know, during wound healing, high molecular weight is broken down to low to cope with the inflammation, to add to the inflammation, that's during a, a period. But if you have your choice, you want those fibroblasts to, producing, to be producing high molecular weight. High molecular weight is angiogenic, it's, it's anti-inflammatory, it sort of puts out the fire and it works beautifully for lubrication and for moisturization. So the challenge that I had there is let's create a um, hyaluronic acid product that will lubricate the surface. That's easy, we've got big molecular weights, doesn't have to be absorbed, we'll do that. But can we find uh, agents that will actually induce the fibroblast to produce high molecular weight. So again, we went through a whole exercise and we found some peptides that really did stimulate. And it wasn't only peptides, there were a, a, a couple of active agents. But what I haven't mentioned to you is that in 2017, I started playing around with amino acids and peptides and looking at what's the, what, what's the makeup of amino acids in elastin? What's the makeup of amino acids in collagen. And I discovered that about 75% of those amino acids were just repetitive and the same sort of story. So I said, that's interesting. Let me take this backbone and I'm gonna add one or two other amino acids to it. And I came up with an octopeptide. Uh, that's an eight amino acid sequence peptide. 
and hadn't been described before. And it, again, to cut a long story short, developed it, did the IP, got it, became a proprietary peptide, and we put it in there. And I, was, I thought, well, okay, this is going to be great in the extracellular matrix. But I stuck this into our tests when we were doing the hyaluronic acid tests for the gene expression, and boom, octopeptide knocked it out of the park. It poured out hyaluronic acid. Oh man, that's amazing. So that became a natural sort of um, uh, component for the, for the elastin product. And then we had a whole lot of others. We put it through testing called gel diffusion, as you know, and that's, that, that, that checks out the proteins that you've got that are producing. And we looked at the different constituents and we had a baseline of 2 million Daltons. We wanted a huge size there that we know the fibroblasts are producing this size. And all our constituents, especially the octopeptide, were producing hyaluronic acid at 2 million Daltons, which means that we have something now that where we can put something on the outside, and on the inside, we have something that will get the fibroblasts to produce high molecular weight. So we've mm -hmm. got a sandwich of high molecular weight. That was beautiful. Then we did the tests and we did the whole... You know, what's interesting in the tests, and when you look at the redness, it almost looks like you can see them the fire going out, that there's inflammation that is being put under control, and I'm sure it's related to the high molecular weight. So that was, that, that, that was a beautiful disruption, very successful as well, beautiful formulation there as well. When we use the HA, yep. do you recommend we put that on first? or where in the sandwich of all the different yeah, products? Yeah, I, I would. So it's thinnest to thickest, absorb very quickly. It's a beautiful formulation. I would put it on first as well. Okay, it, that's absolutely. what I've been doing. Yeah. I think yeah. you taught me that. But exactly. There seems exactly. to be some controversy or some debate on what the order is for the different products. 100%. But I remember you telling me to use that first. Yeah. And it's like giving my skin a drink of water and then also replenishing with more water. Right, and you feel and my like, simple way of thinking Isn't it cool on your skin? Yeah, it's on my skin right like, now. Yeah, I put it on every it's, it's day before I put my nectar so on. It's, it's been such a great product from that perspective. <laughs> okay. And that excitement sort of went on to the next challenge. Yes. You know, we've been nagged for years and years. Vitamin C is, is just, it's part of the whole lingo and, and, and uh, uh, everything that when we talk about skin care, vitamin C comes up time and time again. Yep. And, and people used to say to me, how come elastin doesn't, have, doesn't a have a vitamin C, C product? Don't tell me, boy, I the heard that times over that I heard and that. over. And I said, you know, guys, yeah, vitamin C is great, but we've got a lot of antioxidants that are also really powerful now. Vitamin C antioxidant was the first one on the, on, you know, first one in the game. And then I started looking into the whole story and I came across, again, you know, life is so full of serendipity and luck, but I came across a thesis that was done in, in Toronto and, um, and, and this work done by um, Alexander Hinek and his group in, in Toronto, uh, he was working on a product that he was looking for for cardiovascular story. And he said, you know, in, in cardiac vessels, we talk about elastin, which is the um, elastic uh, protein that actually gives skin its tone. And, and, and at elastin, we're very conscious of elastin. That's been our baby. We want to be able to produce mm -hmm. elastin because it's so important to the skin. And it was one at one stage thought impossible to regenerate. And we showed, hang on, it is possible to, to, to regenerate. But he was looking at it from cardiovascular, looking at major vessels and saying, you know, it's losing its uh, elastin, and actually that's part of the whole problem with cardiovascular disease is the elastin's lacking. Mm -hmm. But I want a product that will actually not produce collagen because it's going to thicken the vessel. I want something that's going to produce elastin but not produce collagen. And he said, you know, I found this, uh, or, or in my research I found the sodium ascorbate, which is the sodium salt of vitamin C. And he says, one of the things that it does, as opposed to l -ascorbate, now l -ascorbate is used across the board. So many companies use this as their basis. Um, this is what uh, was thought to be the best sort of component for vitamin C. He says, but we found l -ascorbate actually destroys, there's an mRNA in tropoelastin that is very sensitive to l -ascorbate, and it is destroying elastin. But in contrast, the sodium salt of ascorbate is actually conserving elastin. So his whole story was taking probenicid, which would actually decrease the amount of collagen from the sodium ascorbate, 
adding that to sodium ascorbate to try and just focus on the elastin formation. And when I read this, there was just the one line in the whole story because he wasn't focusing on anything to do with elastin, but I saw this one line about sodium ascorbate is actually very protective of elastin as opposed to the L ascorbate. And I thought, oh my God, that was my aha moment. You know, for years, nobody's looked at what's happening with elastin with the vitamin C. So I said, I've got to check this out. So we went to the lab. We took Alice Corbett, we took another leading company with their, um, uh, sorry, took a leading company with their Alice Corbett, we took the sodium ascorbate salt and we looked at this and we looked at uh, an ex vivo model. What is an ex vivo model? Guys like you will give me the uh, skin that you have from a facelift, which right. is photo damaged and this is um, perfect skin to create a model with that we can see how it behaves in all its uh, entirety. You can save that for about 10 to 12 days. So you can see that when you put the, the product on, you can, you can monitor gene expression, all sorts of things. And that's what we did here. And we did stains for tropolastin, and lo and behold, in fact, it's just been published this week, this, uh, this paper, where we show tropolastin with the L-ascorbate ferulic acid combination was actually eating into the tropolastin. You can see like a moth-eaten appearance. Mm -hmm. And you look at the sodium ascorbate, or you look at this preparation, and you see that this, the um, elastin is conserved. I use the word conserved because I used to think it was protecting it. Then we did our clinical studies, and that's going to come out soon in the, in, in the publication as well. And we chose randomly five patients that consented to have biopsies done. Mm -hmm. And we looked at the biopsies and we pulled out the elastin. You cannot believe the results. Five out of five just show this, not conservation of elastin, stimulation of elastin. So in fact, what's happening is we getting, and, and that's the other part I didn't mention to you, with all our antioxidants in there, so we've got a whole combination. Sodium ascorbate is just one. We've got 14 other uh, antioxidants, and we tested in it. In this product? In this product, and we tested it against the leading um, uh, competitor. We did those the results in Brazil, just antioxidant, and we found that we're absolutely exactly the same as them in terms of the efficiency. So from an antioxidant perspective, what this is designed for, beautiful, it works fantastically. But the elastin conservation is a whole new element that we've looked at. And conservation now has turned to stimulation. We can see that we're actually pumping out beautiful elastin with us. And that fits so beautifully with the rest of our story because we've always talked about, as you know, extracellular matrix remodeling. Well, what's part of that? It's elastin formation. So if you're using an antioxidant that is now stimulating elastin, and then you put your restorative skin complex on, and then you put, you know, the, the whole bunch of it, you've got something that is working there that is just completely regenerating the extracellular matrix. So that was the fun of this one, and that's, that's our newest one. It has actually broken all records for our launch this has been our biggest uh, success right? in launch it's been fantastic this and do you recommend using it every day yeah do you yeah. recommend um, using so, it twice a day so you know this is a great uh, uh, question because with the conventional Alice score bait what mm -hmm. was happening is there were all sorts of things. I said, listen, this is unstable as hell. So we've got to put it in, in brown jars. Also. Mm -hmm. This is surrounded in lap zones, completely stable. No problems. We don't have to use any special stories. Uh, they used to say you've got to use 10, maybe 20% of L-ascorbate to be efficient. Why? Because it's quite difficult to get into the cell. So you've got to get a big percentage. Okay. We use a tiny percentage of this because there's a Cinderella concentration, which is between a certain amount where it actually stimulates the elastin. So it's a tiny percentage, and that tiny percentage can be a tiny percentage because the sodium channels or the channels for vitamin C entry into the cell are sodium dependent. By having a sodium ascorbate, it has the key to unlock the cell and to open up. We get it in there so easily into the cell. We can use very small amounts, and when you put it around in a liposome, it's stable, protected, don't have to worry about that. Can you use it twice a day? Absolutely. Can you use it with retinols? All the things that used to have, you know, supposedly the problems that we had with the conventional ones, uh -huh. no problem at all. And that's why it's been a sort of easy to use, no smell, no, no problem with stability. You can compound it with, with your retinols. You can use it a whole lot of different things there. Uh, and, and it's non-tacky. It's a beautiful consistency. So all of those have made this a, a, a very nice product now for us. And these products have all been released in the last year, right? They have. That, and in fact, that's why it was interesting to come and chat to you, because since, since our last talk, you know, there's been a right. lot of development in the specialty serum space. Well, so fascinating.
Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Now, if you look forward into your crystal ball, what do you see on the horizon? What do, when I have you back here in a couple of years, yeah, what, what will we be looking at? You know, it's interesting because you, most people will answer that by saying we're so excited about the exosomes I coming in I knew you were going to yeah. say that. That's and, just and, what I thought you'd say. You know, and I'm using exosomes in the, in, in the lab at UCI. What I'm excited about with exosomes is the delivery system. Okay. What I'm worried about with exosomes is nobody's what's looking inside them. So exosome is an envelope. Mm -hmm. It delivers a message. Now we know with messages you can have good and bad messages. And exosomes are involved in cancer formation. They're involved in all sorts of things because it's transmitting a message. Mm -hmm. So where's it coming from? What's the source? You know, if it's platelets, okay, it's coming from a blood bank. I don't know those people in the blood bank where it's coming from. Um, if it's coming from umbilical and it's coming from uh, an young, there's a very different uh, a sequence of regeneration that's needed in a newborn to what's needed in an elderly. And the mRNAs and the DNAs and the lipids and the proteins, they're just hundreds of them. And nobody's taken the time to actually isolate and see what's in there. So my crystal ball is firstly, exosomes are gonna be a beautiful delivery system, not necessarily for biologics, but for a whole lot of things. So drugs, drug delivery is going to be important. Our peptide delivery is going to be important. Exosomes, fantastic. I'm doing work related to that. Then we're going to have designer exosomes, not biologics, not stuff that we don't understand. People are taking a hell of a chance now because you don't know what's in them. They haven't looked at those properly. But when we do understand which miRNA is going to be ideal for this particular indication, okay, let's put that into our designer exosome oh. and we're going to have a targeted approach that is then going to be standardized. It's going to be limited. We know exactly what it's going to do and it's predictable. So that's what I'm excited about. The current one, I'm very concerned about because I'm worried that people are using this and my colleagues, you know, included there without knowing what is the message that's being delivered here and is it something that's going to be positive in that situation and lastly what's the outcome you're looking for you know I, I see that they're using exosomes left right and center in the resurfacing and they're saying to me the redness is improved it's wonderful guys you know we've been improving redness for years and years what about the preconditioning that's changing the whole extracellular matrix? What about your biopsies afterwards? What's it doing? Because if you're using a biologic with the whole risk profile just to help you with redness, that's not a good reason to use it. Rather use something that's much more reliable. But down the line, I think it's going to be designer uh, products. Okay. And do you think we'll be using our own exosomes or we'll be using I think off the shelf? We'll be de developing them off the shelf. And that's the beauty of it. So when you say our own, we're going to be using the design of our own, but okay. we're going to be developing them. So there's a lipid, a phospholipid layer we can create and we can do. And they're already doing, I'm already working with people in Germany that, that, that actually can make those exosomes um, um, artificially. Now, when Are I they say, synthetic? They, well. but they're not. They're really derived from, um, from, from, from different um, biologics, but they are actually manufactured synthetically so that you can produce them and reproduce them in, in batches and make them uh, you know, okay. properly done. I, I'm sort of hesitating because I don't want to Yes, speak. that's okay. Too many well, we can, yeah. We're going to have you back for certain, and then you can explain we'll see it in all a year's to time. us again. Yeah. <laughs> um, and do you think at some point they'll be put into skincare products? Yeah. Okay. You know, I'm trading very gently there because I'm just waiting for the FDA. It's going to come. There's going to be regulation, as there should well, be. Well, there already has been. Exactly. Yeah. So I want to know what is acceptable, what isn't acceptable. That's why I like the, the delivery system. Mm -hmm. Okay, if we're using an empty shell, but it's delivering and it's getting into the cells more efficiently, that's something else. But if you're going to be using something that's in there and you're not quite sure what's in there, that's a problem. So I'm watching from the sidelines. I don't want to be in this game now. I want to be in the game when I know exactly what is acceptable for the FDA and then we make the best of that particular That situation. sounds wise. Yeah. Well, very good. Well, I want to thank you again for coming back up here. You're only the third person that's ever been on the show twice. I'm on it. Thank you. And uh, it's always so wonderful to have you. I learn something every time I talk to you. Uh, and I'm sure our uh, guests, our, excuse me, our watchers and listeners to the program have learned an awful lot also. So have a safe journey back to Orange County, uh, and thank you. Thank you, Grant. Always great to be with you.
And thank you all for joining us on today's episode of The Technology of Beauty, where I have the opportunity to interview the movers and shakers of the beauty business, and today was no exception with Dr. Widrow. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you, Grover. Appreciate Take it. Take care. Thanks.